On this edition of Mississippi Roads, we'll take a look at the state's booming film industry. A number of Hollywood films have come to Mississippi over the years, but homegrown filmmakers are also making their mark. We'll also revisit a story about Willie Morris and the film adaptation of Good Old Boy and The Witch of Yazoo. And we'll look back at coast filmmakers who were inspired by Raiders of the Lost Ark as young boys. Support for the arts segment of Mississippi Roads comes from the Mississippi Arts Commission, whose mission is to be a catalyst for the arts and creativity in Mississippi. Information available at www.arts.ms.gov. Mississippi Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you. Now Mississippi Roads. Welcome back to Mississippi Roads. I'm your host, Walt Grayson. This week, we're coming to you from the charmingly beautiful town square in the city of Canton. As a matter of fact, Canton's town square is so charmingly beautiful that it's landed Canton a major role in Mississippi's booming film industry over the last 20 years. A lot of independent films have been shot here, as well as major Hollywood blockbusters. In fact, the view of the courthouse from this very corner is what convinced director Joel Schumacher to film the adaptation of John Grisham's best-selling novel, A Time to Kill, here in 1995. The producers of A Time to Kill meticulously restored the building that would house two of the film's key sets, the coffee shop and the law office. And both of those buildings are now part of Canton's Film Museum. Now, when you come inside the movie museum here at Canton, you'll probably notice that Canton's movie history has taken on a decided literary bent with works by Willie Morris and Eudora Welty and William Faulkner having been shot here. But young movie makers are finding other areas of the state intriguing. Now take for instance Michael Williams. He's using his hometown of West Point as the backdrop for some of his film work. Let's drop in on the set of Ozland and see what's happening. Is that what happened to everyone else? What? Try up. I suppose. Where do they go when they dry up? Probably just blow away. That's it? I found this cool book. What's it called? The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. I believe it was in 2011. Could have been late 2010, but I was watching the History Channel and someone brought up the question, you know, what if someone in a post-apocalyptic world who had no idea of history or religion found a copy of some narrative fiction and began to think that it was real. So when I started thinking about that, Wizard of Oz came to mind because that's one of my favorite films and I love the book. So I started thinking, well, what if someone in a post-apocalyptic U.S. was roaming through Kansas and they had very little to no knowledge of history or religion, but they found a copy of Wizard of Oz and began to read it and interpret, interpret what's in the book with what they're seeing around them, how that might change their journey or what could come of that. So that was the initial idea. My name is Michael Williams. I'm the writer and director and producer of Ozland. I was born, raised, and I'm still living in West Point, Mississippi. Um, I went to University of Southern Mississippi to get a film degree, and I've come, since then come back to West Point and have a business there where I do video and photography services, services, but also work regionally in film as well as make my own films. Shindopin Productions is based in downtown West Point, and I opened it in 2010 as an actual business, but I've been using the term Shindopin Productions for my films and little side video projects to make money during high school and college since 2004. But when I graduated college, I realized I sat around for six months and didn't have much film work and I needed to pay the bills, so I needed to have some means to make money but still be able to pursue a film career. So that's where the business came in. So I took some chances and opened up a business and been lucky enough that it's been successful to where I can make a modest living and still work in film and have that freedom but have a business that provides hopefully what I would hope is you know, quality video and photography services for my community when there's not much in the area in that way. So I basically do anything video and photography related and also sell independent movies that are made in the area and we also make movies under the umbrella of Shindopin. Uh, well, Mississippi is very, is a very ideal place to make movies for many reasons. I mean, there's the locations, there's the hospitality, there's the sense of culture and history 
and the idea that just about everybody you know is creative in some way or knows someone who's creative or just there's this is the home for storytelling whether it's through music with the blues or it's through um, fictional writing or movies I think people are realizing more and more that movies is more than just entertainment it's also an industry and it's also a way for us to express ourselves and that if we can do it here in Mississippi why not when it's cheaper to do things here there's more support uh, people are just nicer and it's just a great place to make movies so making movies in Mississippi is ideal for me and I hope to do it for the rest of my life. We are one of the states that are very fortunate to have a wide variety of many great festivals that people come from all the country to come to because Mississippi puts on you know, a good show when it comes to film festivals and hospitality. And that's one of my biggest um, things I tell people who want to get into the film industry, go to film festivals. Whether you have a film in it, whether you just want to attend, or you just are interested. There's so many benefits from going to film festivals and that's where I've met a lot of my favorite filmmakers that I interact with all the time or the people that I work with. And that's also how I get my work out there. So if it wasn't for film festivals on the short films that I had previously that filmed that showed at those film festivals, Ozland wouldn't have the support base that it has today. So I definitely want to, when Ozland's finished, submit it to film festivals all over the country, but I'm excited to actually show my first feature here in Mississippi at all the film festivals who have supported me since 2005 when I first started submitting to film festivals. Because if it wasn't for them and their support, I wouldn't be here today and many of the people who worked in Ozland wouldn't be here today. Every film that I make is a personal work. Um, every film I make, whether it's the characters of the story, is something I want to say or something I felt or something I need to express. And Ozland is definitely not an exception to that. Leaf and Emery are two very different characters in the film, but they're both me and things that I've experienced, things that I think. So while they seem very different, the idea is that no one's really that different. Everybody has different parts of their personality that can dictate who they are, but it's also it's not that far and everybody has very similar things, even on, on the outside, it seems like they're not. So I wanted to portray these characters and their interactions and things that are personal to me, but also just ideas. And the film's about faith, friendship, and imagination, which are three very big things for me. So the film explores those and explores the idea of home and different, different aspects that could be used in the Wizard of Oz, but also just not even Wizard of Oz related and just related to humanity. What are we doing? It's gonna come to us. What happened? We tried to chase a tornado, a dust devil tornado. And we just ate a bunch of pie Whoa. and fried chicken. <laughs> and <laughs> we ran from there. Can't see. Ozland was very much a community effort. Everyone had their job, but everyone did everyone's job because that's just what you had to do. You had to do what had to be done. And for Ozland, since we had a very limited crew and we couldn't have everybody we needed, Everybody had to wear a lot of hats, and for myself, I had to be the writer, director, producer, cinematographer, production designer, um, and a lot of other things. But it's rewarding in that sense, since I didn't do all those things myself. The actors helped out. The um, sound guy also did lighting. You know, it's kind of a very communal effort, so I feel like we all, we all made Ozland, and we can't really claim any specific part of it as our own, since it was a very um, collaborative process, and the film wouldn't be as good if it wasn't for that collaborative process, since if it was all just my way or the highway, it wouldn't have been that good because I collect people that I like and whose opinions I respect and whose talent I respect. Therefore, that is shown on screen because it's just that much better when you have that many brains coming together to create something. But hopefully it's gonna be magical. Just down the street from the square in Canton, there's a lot of old historic homes. These homes have, among other things, been inspiration for a lot of movie makers over the years. And take, for instance, the house back behind me here. This is the Mosby House. You may recognize this as being from one of the key scenes in the movie A Time to Kill. That the judge was up on the balcony doing some painting of some of the houses in the neighborhood. Speaking of the neighborhood, right across the street from the Mosby House is another home used in another movie. This one represents young Willie Morris's house as he was growing up in Yazoo City. Of course, the house is here in Canton. This is where Willie and my dog Skip lived. 
The magical days of boyhood were also the inspiration for Action. Willie Morris's Good Old Boy. And while that movie wasn't shot here in Canton, it was the first of Willie's works to be adapted for film. In 1988, it was released on the Disney Channel as The River Pirates. Because it was made back during the TV dark ages, though, the audience was somewhat limited. And fortunately, you can now access this charming classic anytime on the web. It's family-friendly entertainment, Mississippi style. Here's a story that we originally aired back in 1988, just after they had wrapped up filming for the River Pirates in Yazoo City. First thing I usually do when I return to Yazoo after having been away for a long time is I come out to this cemetery. And uh, especially I go up in the new section and I check the new tombstones to see who's died in my absence. So uh, I know I won't, you know, bump into them walking down Main Street. We practically grew up in, in that cemetery. Um, and it's right in the middle of town and accessible to everything. And it's no accident that, that uh, so much a good old boy is set in that cemetery. I grew up in a place called Yazoo City, along the haunting muddy river that winds its way through the Mississippi Delta. It is a land of burnt orange twilights and deep mysteries as old as time itself, of sudden storms that bend prodigious trees into anguished shapes. It's a weird kind of kitties. It's like Rambo, sort of. It's a 1940 Rambo. <laughs> Wiz, no Wiz, but he knows how to keep my hands For a while, I felt this tug on my arm, and I looked down. There was a very good-looking, mischievous uh, young man of about 12 years old, and he had on a a vintage World War II sailor's cap. And uh, in the Southern California accent, he said, are you Willie? And I said, yeah. He said, Willie, where have you been? We've, we've been expecting you for three days. And I said, well, who are you? He said, I'm Willie. He was playing me in the movie, uh, 12 years old, and it was a very strange uh, eerie feeling to watch them filming some of these scenes with people playing my mother and father, long dead, uh, my grandfather, there's my grandmother, um, and then here are the chums of my childhood being played by these Hollywood actors and actresses, and it brought back to me in a bizarre rush uh, those vanished days. It was a deja vu of the most horrendous kind. Every time I return to Yazoo City, no matter where I've lived, where I've been, I come down that Broadway hill and I'm awash in memories. Uh, I know every tree. Uh, I have memories of things that happen on every street corner, in every alleyway, every nook and cranny. Uh, I'm, I'm suffused and overcome with memory. The pre-television age in a small southern town was was a time of storytelling and of playing tricks on each other and of listening to the older people and entertaining the children. I think that's something that is being lost. Give us a sign, Captain Jack. Captain Jack, is that you? Oh, I do believe it truly is. Calling from the beyond. Well, maybe we should take down Daddy's picture. Mr. Percy, t t tell him to go someplace else to do his haunting. Look who come to visit. Oh. It's just the boy again, sister. That's a good one, Willie. <laughs> you had her dancing around like an old baddie hen. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. In L.A., in Hollywood, there's like, you'd have to like drive an hour drive to get to like a pond or something. Even more than that, and go horseback riding still an hour drive. And I love to do all, the, do all those things. and. Well, I've done a lot of stuff here that is like in the movie. 
going fishing and being with my friends a lot. Because the other kids who were playing, the kids in the movie, well, you know, we'd all do a lot of stuff that were, was in the script. I was brought up on the story of the witch, and I told it in, in Good Old Boy, and it's absolutely true. This terrible woman who lived down by the river, she was perhaps the ugliest woman in the United States of America, certainly in Mississippi. She had cocklebirds in her hair and dirt all over her. And people in Yazoo City hated her so much, they didn't even give her a name except the witch or the hag. And in 1884, she died in quicksand down by the Yazoo River. And just before her head went under the quicksand and she died, she said, I hate you. I shall return. I shall return in, on May the 20th, 1904, and burn down the whole town of Yazoo City. Now, this was 1884. Well, people laughed. And they, they really laughed at her threat. But just to be safe, when they buried her here, they put these strong chain links around her grave so that she could not escape. Then people forgot about her. And the long seasons came and went here in Yazoo City and in Mississippi, people forgot. All of a sudden, on that very day in May of 1904, a fire started down here um, in the Wise House. And it caught on and it spread and it burned down most of the town. Then people remembered what the old woman had said, that she was going to burn down the town. And after they put the fire out, it took about three or four days for the, this big fire to be uh, put out. Then the sheriff and some people came out here to the witch's grave, and the chain links had been broken. And that was when they knew that she had escaped, broken those strong chain links, gone into town and burned the whole thing down. And that is a true story. A good old boy is someone who will never let you down, who is brave and imaginative and intensely loyal no matter what happens. We had to work our imaginations out on something. And the less austere, the better. Hey, here's a bit of movie trivia for you. What other spirits were housed inside this crypt from the movie My Dog Skip other than ghosts? Here's a hint. <laughs> we're going back to the 1980s again for our next story. Well, actually, it started in the 1980s, but it didn't end until three decades later. But in the 1980s, it was when three youngsters on the Gulf Coast had the inspiration or I guess you could call it the obsession, since they hung with it for so long, to recreate scene by scene Steven Spielberg's movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. And we're going to look back in the rearview mirror at a story we did about them and their finished product in 2007. <laughs> In 1981, Chris Trumpola saw Raiders of the Lost Ark for the first time, and he wanted nothing more than to become the hero, Indiana Jones. And thus, he came up with a unique way to inhabit the character. Chris convinced two of his fellow Gulf Coast friends to help him shoot a scene-by-scene -scene recreation of the movie. It took us all in all seven years to complete. We started in the summer of 82 and, and, uh, and finally finished and showed it in August 1989, starting when we were 12 years old and finished when we were 19. The first day that we actually wound up shooting, which was a good year and a half after we started, um, that first day uh, I was like, okay, no, no, I, I drew the storyboards, the camera goes here, and really you're supposed to pan and, you know, and we, we kind of fell into our roles and, and you know, absolutely absence of ego is just, you know, Chris said, hey, Eric, how about you be director and, and I'll be producer. And it's like, okay, sure, yeah, that's fine. And that was really all there was to it. Yeah. And we just sort of gravitated to our natural roles. The parents of the boys were very supportive of their project, but were surprised at the will and determination they had to see it through. It's good to be back. 
a special place here. But I remember renting one of our first cameras from one of the Captain Video stores, you know, and then of course we had access to some TV equipment because at that time I was involved with a television station here. Um, as far as the whips and the hats and all the props, they asked for them for Christmas or they borrowed things or they gave people credit. They had underwriters. I mean, they were like very real movie producers. Salvation Army, Goodwill, we'd find just junk in the basement and junk in my grandfather's garage and make stuff. I mean, all the Nazi memorabilia was like old tablecloths and Eric sewed those by hand and, and um, you know, you just pick and scrape and salvage whatever you can, wherever you can. Most of the interior shots were, were shot right here in this house, uh, you know, Eric's mom's house. We, we converted the entire basement and most of the rooms and just about as much square footage as we could uh, of the house into a soundstage. Action! There was really only one time where I think we were, you know, quote unquote, shut down by the studio bosses, our moms, um, is when, you know, uh, we were so excited uh, shooting the fire scene, you know, and uh, we, we lit Eric on fire with gasoline. And for some reason, uh, you know, our moms had a problem with this and, and uh, we showed it to them and we were so excited and they watched it and they said, okay, absolutely not, no more fire, you cannot do this. In fact, I think Eric recalls that my mom said, can't you throw leaves at each other or throw bags of leaves at each other? And I was just like, uh, no, mom. Just don't understand, mom. Yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's just silly. Let it go. There's a great outtake of Eric's on fire saying, did you get the shot? Did you get the shot? <laughs> and like, I think it's either me or somebody else standing just off, you know, just off to the side, reading the instructions on a fire how you, extinguisher. How do you get this thing to work? Yeah, let's see. Uh, Step da, 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 one. Eric's, yeah. Eric's on fire, <laughs> you know? It's, it's funny. One of the hardest scenes the boys had to recreate was the legendary truck scene. But after seven years of shooting, they had a few tricks up their sleeves. The truck scene was one of the, the latter films that we shot. And we'd kind of, by that time, uh, you know, actually accrued some filmmaking skills right. and, and gelled as a team, as a crew. And we we're kind of on top of our game. And, and uh, I think it comes across. It's both our favorite scene, uh, the truck scene. And, and, uh, and to do it, I mean, um, you know, the, uh, the missing engine, you know, this big gaping hole in the cab allowed for us to stick the camera down there and get some great shots of Chris pulling himself up the back of the truck. Built a wooden cage for our cameraman, Jason, to sit in that connected uh, so he could shoot into the cab while it was moving. Yeah, hooked onto the side so we could yeah. get those nice shots from outside the cab. Yeah. So in 1989, after seven long years in the making, a premiere party was put on by the parents of the boys in Gulfport. A full 15 or 16 years later, you know, jump from 89 to 2003, and we're contacted out of the blue by Eli Roth, horror movie filmmaker, who uh, got a copy in the hands of Steven Spielberg, who saw it, loved us, and wrote us each a letter of, of thanks, of appreciation. And that's when this uh, resurfacing and this building excitement just uh, started that led to us having a a world premiere in Austin, Texas, which led to us being written up by Harry Knowles on Ain't It Cool News, which has readership in the millions. All of a sudden, this little Raiders film that no one's heard about, people are talking about in the Netherlands. Iceland. You know, you know. And yeah. then that led in turn to a 10,000 word article in Vanity Fair's Hollywood issue in 2004. And that led to the Scott Rune Life Rights deal. And, uh, With Paramount Studios and now they're making a movie about us. They're not only making a movie about the boys' lives, but Chris and Eric decided to start their own independent film company, appropriately entitled Rolling Boulder Films. They recently completed writing their first script and hope to shoot the film in Mississippi. But if you want to catch the Raiders adaptation, don't go to your local video store. You have to go to one of the charity screenings, like the one we attended on the coast. You know, one, one 12 year old kid came up to, to me and said, is that your film? I said, yeah. I said, that was great. And 
So I, oh my God, Chris, that was us. Yeah. It's an incredible, pleasurable honor to be able to kind of sit back in a very, you know, in a very joyful place and watch our little movie that we did in our backyard back in the 1980s inspire people. You know, that's, and, and also to a certain extent educate, you know, educate and inspire, you know, an, another army of young filmmakers that are going to go out in their backyards with their digital camcorders and, and, and follow their dreams. That, I think probably for me is, is the most satisfying. Quick update on our young filmmakers. Since this story aired in 2007, they've garnered a lot of attention about their project, now being dubbed as the greatest fan film ever made. Matter of fact, there's been a documentary done about their venture, and it debuted in the 2015 South by Southwest Film Festival. And that's it for this show. If you'd like information about anything you've seen in the program, contact us at mpbonline.org slash Mississippi Roads, or like our Mississippi Public Broadcasting Facebook page. Till next time, I'm Walt Grayson, and I'll be seeing you on Mississippi Roads. Mississippi Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you.